Hello and welcome to the New Republic Salon. I'm Laura Marsh. I'm the literary editor of the New Republic. And today I'm talking with Ruman Alam about his new novel, Leave the World Behind. Ruman, it's very good to see you. How are you Hi. doing? It's really good to see you. I really miss the days when our paths would cross in the New Republic's beautiful offices in Union Square. But it's nice to see you on my computer screen. <laughs> I know. I feel like we, uh, yeah, the last time I saw you, we were not living in this post apocalyptic. Um, reality. So it's very nice to see you. Congratulations on being shortlisted for the National Book Award in Fiction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to use that to segue into my <laughs> quick bio of Roman. Uh, so his new novel is Leave the World Behind. He's also the author of That Kind of Mother and Rich and Pretty. Um, and so I thought the way we would do this is um, that we would start with a short reading from your book and then talk and then maybe have another reading and talk and then um, get some questions from the audience. Um, for people who are in the audience, if you're wondering how that works, because obviously we're not on the room together, um, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of Zoom. Um, so if you have a question at any point, you don't need to wait till the end of the event, you can just click on that and drop a question in for Ramon. And um, at the end of the event, I will read them to, to him. Um, all right, so Ramon. Um, do you want to start off by, I, I guess, just saying a little bit about the book and going into the reading that you've chosen? Sure. I mean, I always feel like it's like a particular agony to make the author like recap what the book is about, but I will, I will take a stab at it. Um, Leave the World Behind is a novel about a family of four, um, a white upper middle class family from a nice part of Brooklyn, heading out on vacation. They're going to a kind of quiet, not that fashionable part of Long Island. Like not the part of Long Island where you buy a luxury car or, you know, have a cocaine dealer. It's the part of Long Island where you would have a beautiful old farmland turned into like a sort of rambling little house. Um, they're there to hang out at the pool and go, you know, go to the beach. And the second night of their holiday, there is a knock at the door and a older black couple is standing on the doorstep and they tell them that it is their house, that they rented it to them via Airbnb and that they've come there from New York City because there's been some kind of unspecified or maybe unknowable emergency. I guess there's been a blackout. They say there's been a blackout. From there, the book becomes a book about what has actually happened. Is there a blackout in New York City? What does that mean? What are these six people who are now in this house together going to do? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not somebody who's overly concerned with spoilers when it comes to books because books are done. And, you know, like knowing what happens to Emma Bovary doesn't spoil your experience of reading it. But, uh, you know, I, I do think that there's like a, I hope there's a particular pleasure in encountering this book without knowing too much about what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, the section I was going to read to start us off is very brief because I feel like when people read to me, I fall asleep and I don't want anyone watching to fall asleep. Um, but I'm going to read a scene when they have uh, first arrived on Long Island and Amanda, who is the mother of this family, goes to the grocery store. All right. The store was frigid, brightly lit, wide aisled. She bought yogurt and blueberries. She bought sliced turkey, whole grain bread, that pebbly mud colored mustard and mayonnaise. She bought potato chips and tortilla chips and jarred salsa full of cilantro, even though Archie refused to eat cilantro. She bought organic hot dogs and inexpensive buns and the same ketchup everyone bought. She bought cold hard lemons and seltzer and Tito's vodka and two bottles of $9 red wine. She bought dried spaghetti and salted butter and a head of garlic. She bought thick cut bacon and a two pound bag of flour and $12 maple syrup in a faceted glass bottle like a tacky perfume. She bought a pound of ground coffee, so potent she could smell it through the vacuum seal, and size four coffee filters made of recycled paper. If you care, she cared. She bought a three pack of paper towels and a spray on sunscreen and aloe because the children had inherited their father's pale skin. She bought those fancy crackers you put out when there were guests and Ritz crackers, which everyone liked best, and a crumbly white cheddar cheese and extra garlicky hummus and an unsliced hard salami and those carrots that are tumbled around until they're the size of a child's fingers. 
She bought packages of cookies from Pepperidge Farm and three pints of Ben and Jerry's politically virtuous ice cream and a Duncan Hines box mix for a yellow cake and a Duncan Hines tub of chocolate frosting with a red plastic lid because parenthood had taught her that on a vacation's inevitable rainy day, you could while away an hour by baking a boxed cake. She bought two tumescent zucchini, a bag of snap peas, a bouquet of curling kale so green it was almost black. She bought a bottle of olive oil and a box of Entenmann's crumb top donuts, a bunch of bananas and a bag of white nectarines and two plastic packages of strawberries, a dozen brown eggs, a plastic box of pre-washed spinach, a plastic container of olives, some heirloom tomatoes wrapped in crinkling cellophane, marbled green and shocking orange. She bought three pounds of ground beef and two packages of hamburger buns, their bottoms dusty with flour and a jar of locally made pickles. She bought four avocados and three limes and a sandy bundle of cilantro, even though Archie refused to eat cilantro. It was more than $200, but never mind. I'll stop there. Um, I'm so glad that you chose to read this scene because uh, it was one of my favorite scenes in the book. It was a scene that I saw people discussing before I got a chance to read this book because it, it hits a very particular spot and I think if you're a certain kind of person you recognize yourself in, in that scene a little bit too much um <laughs> you know I saw people saying that I felt seen for two scenes yeah <laughs> scene. but uh it's a really interesting choice to write a long kind of check out of the grocery scene like that um how did that come to you because I, I feel like I know this woman from what was in that yeah shopping cart. <clears throat> I don't know how the idea came to me necessarily, but I, 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 can, I can talk about why I think it works, which is that it's just, it's anthropology, right? And it's anthropology, uh, like my field study, it's like firsthand field study, right? It's like a self indictment. Like this is the kind of person that I am. I go on holiday with my family and I buy the organic tomatoes and I, you know, buy us the, you know, junk food, but like a certain kind of junk food, right? Like, a certain kind, like Ben and Jerry's is a very particular kind of junk food that's different from a box of generic cookies. Like it contains its sort of significance. It orients you in the structure of class. I mean, this is like, capital is like what defines us in this country. And mm -hmm. so the way that you spend your money is the story you're telling the world about who you are. And so this is the story that, but, and, and it, it's very intimate when you're buying groceries. Like it's the story you're telling your own family. It's the story you're telling yourself. This is the people we are. We buy the um, recycled paper coffee filters. Like those, that is who we are. And I think that that person is probably the kind of person who reads literary fiction. And so if there's a moment of recognition on the page, like it makes sense. And, and even if there's not that moment of recognition, hopefully you understand how to, how to, how to think about these people based on this list of their things. And um, yeah, I, I, I love lists and I love, um, it's the kind of um, urban flotsam you find in the street sometimes. And I find that stuff so fascinating. It really shows you like what a person is when you go into someone's house and you see inside of their kitchen cabinets, you see inside of their medicine cabinets, it tells you the story of who they are. Their possessions tell you the story of who they are. And it felt like an efficient way of saying, these are a certain kind of people from a certain kind of zip code from a certain kind of coastal city. It just felt like rather than saying mm -hmm. that, I could just talk about what they buy. Right. I feel like that something very clever about it though is that you almost build in, there's some narrative expectations built in there and that this is the kind of week they're yeah. expecting to have. It's food for a whole week. Yes. Which to me yeah. is interesting too, because I never used to grocery shop for a whole week. I was the kind of person who would grocery shop for like two, the next two hours. <laughs> that yeah. was done. Tomorrow I'll have to buy some more food. The cupboard's <laughs> empty. But and then there's the kind of um ominous foreshadowing of this yellow cake for a rainy day. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we yeah. know this is not gonna yeah. be a novel where there's gonna be a rainy day. Um, yeah. That's I mean very there is sad. a rainy day. They do, they they do bake the yellow cake on a rainy <laughs> day, but like the circumstances are quite different than the expectation. I think there's there's a there is a an atmosphere of something looming over the early pages of the book, and um, 
I think it's buried in those details. Mm -hmm. Like early on, I described the car that they're driving in on the Long Island Expressway. And um, I talk about how the windows have um, like a colorant that's meant to keep cancer at bay. Like there's a kind of feeling that these people are under the narrative's scrutiny and then also kind of like under the, like the, there's some pressure bearing down on them inside the book and it's unclear what it's going to be. Um, and there's all these sort of suggestions. Like at one point there is a suggestion that someone is watching them from the woods. Like there's all these like feints that make you feel like you're, it, just like when you watch a horror film and you, you see the pretty blonde girl about to go swimming and you're like, oh, something bad's gonna happen to you. Like I can just tell mm -hmm. because I understand the conventions of this story. Um, so tell us a bit more about Amanda and Clay because they're the couple that we kind of see most of this story it's close to them. Yeah. <clears throat> Amanda is uh, has the kind of job that like so many people have that I find so fascinating where um, she works in advertising her job is to work in sort of client relations and so her job is effectively like this middleman job where like the job is just attending to like talking about the job. I love this kind of thing because it's so hard to, it's so hard to hold on to what it is you do. It's like you just, you send emails and you like take people out to dinner. And I, the, the whole way of working, I mean, who knows if that way of working will endure after whatever's happening in this cultural moment. But um, I, I've known so many people like this who are, exist in this sort of like interstitial place where they're not making something or like enacting something their responsibility is some other kind of nebulous thing. Clay is a professor of media studies, which I chose because I think it is a hilarious turn of phrase. I have no idea what it really implies. When I talk about his academic work in the book, it has a lot of fun sort of suggesting that like even he doesn't really know what it is he is meant to be doing. Um, and he is a professor at City College. Like he's a, you know, he's, that's a great job. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to knock that institution, but like, there's a suggestion that he is sort of like a middling academic. You know, he's writing a, when we meet, his work that he's engaged in as this vacation begins as he's writing a book review for the New York Times Book Review. He's very preoccupied with it. It's, you know, it's, I think it's 900 words. Like it's, but it's, he's taking it very seriously. He's really grappling with that. Well, I have to say, um, I look discounted at that <laughs> because I noticed that he was drinking on the job. <laughs> Right? He pours he himself a vodka <laughs> soda. I mean, this was the thing as a book review editor where I was like, it's interesting that Ramon would, would write this character <laughs> drinking vodka and kind of paging through the book. That was, I love that detail. It tells, it tells you a lot about this man. He's like pretty comfortable. Um, and he wants to be, there's a great line of saying, he wants to be the kind of person who would write book reviews for the New York Times. But he doesn't really want to do the work of writing the book review for the New York Times. Yes. And so I he's doing right. it on his vacation yeah. and he's drinking yeah. and kind of like tossing it off. And I, you know, this isn't yeah. described in the book, but I imagine there is a character in the like deep background of this book, who's an editor at the New York Times, who is like, <laughs> oh, I got to really ask for some revision to why, this Why one. did I assign, why did I assign it to this guy? That's my I leave the all behind fanfic. Like... <laughs> <laughs> If you ever do the you know, sequel. He's a little mediocre. Like he's a little, I think there's, there are people who are striving. I don't think that they're bad people. And when I say striving, I don't think, I don't mean that in the way that we usually apply that term to like a desire to break into the middle class. They're, they have a desire to break into an intellectual class and to a more moneyed part of the middle class. They want to feel more confident and more polished and Again, this just, I feel like I know these people. I feel like I've seen these people and you encounter these people. If you live in a certain kind of place, as I do, I live in Brooklyn, like, and you go to a certain kind of playground or you have playdates at your friends, at your children's friends' parents' house, and there's a certain kind of tension when you go and you realize the playdate invitation is at a beautiful townhouse in Brooklyn Heights. And there's a different kind of tension when it's in like a tiny railroad apartment and like it's messy. like. That's, that is sort of the thing that these people are very attuned to is these markers of class and like where they fit in in the world as they understand it. So two people who are not mediocre and have kind of arrived at a, a more comfortable position perhaps are the two people who knock on the door, um, Ruth and GH. Um, how did, yeah. they are characters who I think are deliberately very hard to place. You know, they, 
they're both very self-aware, they're very accomplished, and they're very aware of what other people might expect of them. They're always sort of like um, trying to anticipate that and sort of lead, I think, you know, allay people's concerns and also kind of take ownership of the situation. How did you go about building up those two characters, especially the character of GH? It's, it's funny because I think it, that's an astute observation that they are harder to know. And, uh, and in some ways that's part of what makes them feel real to me is that they're sort of like, there's this performative aspect to the way they handle themselves in the world. I have known men like GH, younger men, <clears throat> who have a way of talking about money in particular, um, they have a, GH works in um, private equity. I don't even know what that means. I literally have no idea what that means. Um, but they have a kind of religious faith in money and numbers and like what they, what they call the market, right? And I felt like I understood what that kind of person was like. Because I have friends who are married to guys like that, who are much younger, but who like will get excited about talking about like, like if you try to talk to them about the political, the contemporary political reality, what they come back to you with is like, oh, well, the market will solve. Like, if you're worried about like foreign policy, the market will solve this. If you think you're about buying a home, like you need to understand the market. And it's like, what are you, it's like you're talking about Yahweh. You know, it's like I'm talking, like I'm talking to a rabbi. Like, I don't really know what it is you're talking about. And so that is how GH thinks about the world. And it was actually so much fun to write about someone like that, especially someone who is older, who is, more rightly possessed of the confidence to talk that way by virtue of being in his 60s. Like he's, he's an accomplished man. Um, Ruth feels still quite vague to me, um, although I'm maybe fondest of her of all the people inside of this book um, because of that. Uh, she is of a generation where I think the concern, the principal concern for her was being a wife and like what that responsibility, what it meant to be like the wife of a man with a serious job, which is a kind of performance. And I think that she's very attuned to performance and this couple, when they show up on the doorstep of their own home are immediately performing. They're performing a genial kind of blackness because they're conscious of the fact that they may look like interlopers. They're performing a kind of like sweet elderliness because they want to seem safe and you know throughout the book they perform Ruth especially performs almost as a hostess because it's her home and that's sort of what she's expecting of herself to be like the hostess to these people even though the circumstances are so bizarre right I mean I think the setup of that encounter where you have the black couple who are very accomplished who own the house knocking on the door and the suspicion from the white couple and the white family is when I heard that that was the kind of the premise of the book, I was like, wow. I mean, I can imagine so many directions you could go in from yeah. that setup. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was that kind of the germ of the, the idea? I, I'm curious where you sort of, where the idea for this novel grew. Yeah, I think it's a, it's like a nest or like, I, I don't actually know what like the visual metaphor would be. But so the idea, the initial hope or the initial ambition was to write a, <clears throat> a domestic novel and one that felt so explicitly so by virtue of its relationship to the house itself. Like so that you would have to talk about it that way because the house would feel so much of a part of the book um, that pushed through the domestic, through the usual conventions of the domestic into um, something very big something that felt undeniably that there were political and cultural ramifications for the narrative. Then this other aspect of the book, which is this kind of faint toward um, suspense or like a race, a race conscious comedy of manners, it felt, it just felt like I was dealing with layers of convention. Like that is such a convention of, you know, from guests who's coming to dinner from Somebody, a critic mentioned six degrees of separation, which had not even occurred to me, but like this notion of like a certain kind of cosseted whiteness confronting blackness right on its doorstep and being utterly disarmed and trying to figure out how to proceed and things not being <laughs> exactly what they seem. So that was really, um, so those sort of two endeavors collided. But ultimately I think the book becomes, I mean, I'm curious to hear if you, 
if there's a point at which you knew what the book was going to be doing or not, because I think it sort of ultimately does something that felt unpredictable even to me. Yeah, I think so, because I think that's only one, I'm hesitant to call it sort of the premise of the book, because I think that's only one thing the book does. I mean, it's like the, the event that underpins this book and the reason they've shown up is so much bigger than the tensions that yeah. play out between these yeah. people and they have to kind right. of figure out how to address this bigger thing together. I mean, when I was thinking about, yeah. uh, before I got to read the book, when I was thinking about the kind of story that is, a lot of the comparisons I kept thinking of are from film, right? So like guess who's coming to dinner yeah. or um, get yeah. out maybe where you have the yeah. kind of boyfriend coming home and a similar yeah. thing of like the domestic space and people mixing um, or then uh, a, maybe even a film like Funny Games um, where it's like a home invasion film and again at a very nice very, place. Very, very much so. Very I mean, much so. And yeah, the minute you yeah. meet G.H. and Ruth, you know that unless they're like really, really good actors and very sinister people, this isn't <laughs> going to be Funny Games. Um, but yeah. it's interesting that all of those comparisons are from film. I, I felt yeah. like this is not a very explored dynamic in fiction and maybe I'm missing something, but I wondered um, what you thought about that because when you're writing, you must be thinking, is my book like this? Is my book like that? And I wondered right, kind of how right. you felt, yeah. um, like what you felt the kind of like analogs were to the kind of story you were trying to tell. Well, I'm so happy that you said funny games because that was very much in mind. Um, I think I'm working with a suite of reference and you know, it's all private reference, like it's sort of immaterial, but like it's all there, right? Um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was another one. Like the idea of this like very odd conviviality. Like what happens ultimately is GH and Ruth and, and Amanda and Clay end up like drinking together and having dinner together. And like, they're very, it's very, it's almost festive. There's a line that says, I think it's almost like Thanksgiving. But underneath that, there's this sense of menace, exactly as in all these play, where it's like they're drinking so much and they're having a good time, but there's some weird thing happening that you are trying to figure out what it is. So I was thinking about Virginia, oh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? I was thinking about funny games. I mean, I guess I was thinking about Get Out, although I, I, I do think I was also conscious of trying not to think about Jordan Peele. And in fact, I didn't watch the movie Us until after I had turned the book in. Um, even though it was a book, it was a movie I was very curious to watch. I mean, there's a kind of warped relationship between contemporary cinema and contemporary fiction. I mean, I can't deny that the cinematic influence, but to me, I mean, the work is, it's a work of, it's a work of fiction. Like it's like working it out. It's working out that sensibility in language. It's not like attempting to replicate the experience you would have of watching a film. But because I'm also, also I think in part what you're asking is like, I'm dealing with so many conventions, so many narrative conventions that also exist in books, but I just haven't read those books. I'm not as deeply steeped in a literature that is about horror or thriller. I'm much more, I, I know those conventions much more from film. Mm -hmm. Like I described to you before, like the idea that like when you see a, a pretty girl undressed by the lake at night, you understand something terrible is coming or that the film is going to have some kind of faint and you're gonna feel relieved that nothing terrible happens to her, right? Like, so all of that stuff <clears throat> to me comes from my experience with film. And it's not even that I watch these kinds of films all the time, it's just that you know them, they're part of our culture, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I mean, what you don't, that visual language is so recognizable, I think, to everyone, including the reader too, which I think adds to yeah. the sense of expectation. Yeah. Um, okay, well, the next reading you're gonna do, more ominous. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we get to that? Yeah, um, I, will, I will only say that this is, um, like halfway through the book, the two kids, Archie and Rose, <coughs> go wandering away from the swimming pool into the woods behind this house. In the woods, you had this sense of something you couldn't see no matter how you tried. There were bugs, dun-colored toads holding still, mushrooms in fantastical shapes that seemed accidental, the sweet smell of rot, inexplicable damp, you felt small, like one of many things, and the least important, too. Maybe, maybe, 
something had happened to them. Maybe something was happening to them. For centuries, there was no language to describe the fact that tumors blossomed inside lungs, beautiful volunteers like flowering plants that take root in unlikely places. Not knowing what to call it did not change it. Death by drowning as your chest filled with sacks of liquid. Rose felt eyes on her, but then she pretended often that she was being watched. She saw herself at the remove of a cell phone camera. She was young and didn't understand that was how everyone saw themselves, as the main character of a story, rather than one of literal billions, our lungs slowly filling with salt water. In the woods, the light was different. The trees interfered with it. The trees were alive and felt like Tolkien's maj majestic creatures. The trees were watching and not impartially. The trees knew what was up. The trees talked amongst themselves. They were sensitive to the seismic reverberations of bombs far distant. Trees miles away where the ocean had begun to breach the land were dying though it would take years for them to be reduced to albino logs. The trees had all the time the rest of us do not. The mangroves could outsmart it, pull up their roots like a Victorian lady's skirts, sip the salt from the ground, so maybe they'd be fine with the alligators and the rats and the roaches and the snakes. Maybe they'd be better off without us. Sometimes, sometimes, suicide is a relief. That was the right noun for what was happening. The sickness in the ground and in the air and in the water was all a clever design. There was a menace in the woods and Rose could feel it and another child would have called it God. Did it matter <coughs> if a storm had metastasized into something for which no noun yet existed? Did it matter if the electrical grid broke apart like something built of Lego? Did it matter if Lego would never biodegrade would outlast Notre Dame, the pyramids at Giza, the pigment daubed on the walls at Lascaux? Did it matter if some nation claimed responsibility for the outage? Did it matter that it was condemned as an act of war? Did it matter if this was the pretext for a retaliation long hoped for? Did it matter that proving who had done what via wires and networks was actually impossible? Did it matter if an asthmatic woman named Deborah died after six hours trapped on an F train stalled beneath the Hudson River and that the other people on the subway walked past her body and felt nothing in particular? Did it matter that machines meant for supporting life ceased doing that hard work after the failure of backup generators in Miami, in Atlanta, in Charlotte, in Annapolis? Did it matter if the morbidly obese grandson of the eternal president actually did send a bomb? Or did it matter simply that he could if he wanted to? The children couldn't know that some of this had happened. That in an old age home in a coastal town called Port Victory, a Vietnam vet named Peter Miller was floating face down in feet of water. That Delta had lost a plane traveling between Dallas and Minneapolis during the disruption of the air traffic control system. That a pipeline was spilling crude onto the ground in an unpopulated part of Wyoming. That a major television star had been struck by a car at the intersection of 79th and Amsterdam and died because the ambulances couldn't get anywhere. They couldn't know that the silence that seemed so relaxing in the country seemed so menacing in the city, which was hot, still, and quiet in a way that made no sense. Nothing matters to children but themselves. Or perhaps that is the human condition. Thank you. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a great passage to read, actually. Um, well, so Thank as I you. said, one of the things I really loved about the book, and especially in the first part, was these lavish evocations of like vacation home in Long Island, especially as this is a, a summer when I think most people have not been able to have yeah. any kind of vacation. Yeah. This was like um, sure. a vicarious vacation for me, going yeah. on Amanda and Clay's vacation. But then you tip into the kind of thing you just read. Um, what was it like yeah. for you to make that shift in the writing? Um, well, because I knew that was the that was the intention. I knew I was going there all along. So it was actually great fun. And it was kind of a relief when I finally got there. Um, I think that all of the, <clears throat> my hope is that the early pages, which are very different, right? They're about 
people having sex and eating food and having a kind of like luxurious experience. My hope is that you understand the relationship between the latter half of the book and the first half of the book. The first half of the book shows these people as flailing animals and the latter half of the book shows them as flailing animals in a world that's gone completely off kilter. So, but it was great fun. It was great fun. It was, um, it's a little sadistic, there's like some sadistic pleasure, right? In like using your imagination to go into um, dark territory as opposed to the territory of luxury, like or sex or sort of more sensual pleasure that the first half of the book is interested in. That. Um, and so the challenge was to sort of scare myself to think of the ways in which, um, and of course I think that fundamentally the thing that is most scary is not knowing. So in the latter half or in the section that I just read, what you get is a lot of information, but none of it really tells you anything. It's these tiny little details that seem like they imply a cohesive <coughs> explanation of what's happening in the world, but they don't, they really don't. And they, um, that was what was so fun about it. <laughs> well, that's a, it's an interesting narrative choice because what you just read is quite different in terms of the narration from the rest of the book. It's, it's mostly oh, yeah. a very, it's a third person kind of closely observed, like very much working in the kind of like mid 20th century um, yeah. realist novel. But then there are these passages like the one you just read where we're not really being told this happened we're being told like would it did it matter yeah. if and you know not yeah. all of it's true um it it's a kind of a an interesting place to have got to and i'm curious uh was that something that you always knew was going to be in the book or was that was that no, like no i i feel like that's the kind of thing when if you came up with it you're like <laughs> finally i figured out how to do it but so Laura, i'm curious the process you're a very astute reader because that's exactly what happened. The first few drafts of this book work with a lot of distance. That's the sort of the mode of the contemporary, like in the moment that we live in, that is the mode, the novelistic mode. A, a very tight third person that almost implies the interiority of the character being described. So the third person could almost be the first person. So when you're hearing Amanda about Amanda at the grocery store, she could almost be saying, I, Amanda, am buying these things, but instead it's the narrative saying it. It's that close. That really works to bring the reader into the same space as the character. But the tension of this book is that the characters do not know what is happening. And on some level, the reader has to know what is happening, even if the people inside of the book do not. And when my editor, and I wish I could remember, I, I've worked with three editors on this book, so I wish I could remember who's who said this to me in this way? But when they said that to me, I realized, oh, the book needs like a God narrator. It needs like a Victorian novels narrator to step in here and say, here's what is happening. And I'm only going to tell you the, re the reader and not these people involved. And that realization I think was very clarifying and really helped make the book. If the book works, I think it works because of that, because the characters cannot know what is happening, but if the reader doesn't know, she's going to lose her mind with frustration. She's going to throw the book out the window, you know? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. How long were you working on the book? I, I started writing this book. I had the idea for this book at the end of 2017. And I started writing this book when I, in the middle of 2018, when I was working at the New York Times. Um, I had a secret Twitter account where I would make notes and I would write lines from this book. I wrote the first chapter of this book, I think on Twitter as tweets. Um, and so I was really like intellectually or imaginatively immersed in the world, but mm -hmm. I didn't have the pages. And then I left that job at the end of 2019, no, excuse me, the end of 2018. <laughs> and I was really adrift and I needed something to do. Um, in fact, I did a big book review for you at New York mm -hmm. Public. And then I went away uh, for a week to a hotel room because I was like, I have this idea. I have this idea. And in a week, I wrote almost half of a draft of this book. It fell out of my head. Like it was just so ready to come out. Um, so I think I wrote a draft of this book in three weeks in like between January and February of 2019. Um, and then spent <laughs> the balance of the year shaping it and, and trying to do, uh, accomplish the things like I just explained about the sort of understanding mm -hmm. how to make the narrative work. Um, 
so it came, this is a book that came together very, very quickly, I think. Right. It's interesting you say it was written over three weeks because I think it's very pacey and it's short chapters yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that hit a lot of beats. And that makes a lot more sense to me than the fact that the Genesis was in Twitter because I didn't see any trace of what I would think of as yeah. that style. Do you see... No. Um, Okay, because I was curious, yeah. I mean, maybe in the kind yeah. of tautness of the sentences, because they're it's sort of... I mean, I think, yeah, I think nice, in attention but... to the sentence as the unit, like, you know, I'm thinking about the sentence as a unit, but only in that. Like, it wasn't about a stylistic aspiration, it was simply about a way to be productive. And it's something that I really mm -hmm. advise to people who want to be engaged in creative work and are doing some other thing, which most of us are working jobs and also trying to do this work, is you kind of have to trick yourself into doing it. It's sort of like when you trick yourself into going for a run and then going to run the errand, you know, like you run to mm -hmm. the grocery store and then you go shopping and walk home. Like it's a way of tricking yourself into being productive. That's all it was for me. Right. Um, then I wanted to clarify that because I feel like, like it's not no, a Twitter good. novel. That's a good point. It's really not. I, I don't um, think it is. I don't think it is. Yeah. I, I definitely was very surprised because I heard you talked about that on Fresh Air. Um, and I yeah. like to clarify yeah. that. Um, okay, so you do go to some pretty horrific places and with this book, there's a lot we don't know, but there are a few, and I don't want to mention what they are actually, because I think that is a spoiler and I was shocked by them. So I, I want other people to have that experience. Um, but there are some really horrific places you go to and I wondered if there are sources of inspiration for some of the kind of body horrors. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, there's, so animals, I find animals very um, uncanny. I am not someone who has pets. I'm very like weirdly alarmed by pets. Um, animals have like this weird interior intelligence that humans can never crack and that freaks me out somehow. Um, so there's a lot of animal in this book and animals are also like, it's a very powerful thing from mythology, from like folklore, like animal, the sense that animals know something that humans don't is baked into like every, culture's mythology. Um, and then in terms of the body, you know, I'm a parent and nothing is more darling actually when you're, than when your small children lose their milk teeth. Like it's super cute. They just like are these little tiny wisps of thing and they just fall out of their mouths and their mouths look so silly and like fleshy and like unguarded for a period of time while their big teeth are coming in. And there's a particular, there's something to do with teeth in this book and there's, and that's a, about inverting my own feeling of like how sweet that moment is to turn something that is that sweet into something that's really horrific, feels really effective. And also teeth are something that like is very, we have like a weird psychic connection to that. Like we have all had bad dreams about our teeth falling out. Like mm -hmm. it's just sort of part of the like language of the culture. And so I had a lot of fun choosing those things that were going to alarm hopefully alarm the uh -huh. reader. I mean, they alarm no, I mean the teeth right thing is <laughs> very much what I had in mind. And I won't say anything more about it other than it's the teeth thing. Um, but yeah, the, the thing about the connection with the milk teeth, that makes it much more horrifying for me. I hadn't even thought of that. Apparently there <laughs> is a special part of your brain that just deals with recognizing people's teeth and noses. And that's why really? a lot of people have really horrifying dreams that involve like those parts of the body being distorted. So really? it tapped oh. into something really deep. <laughs> yes, I think, I think there is a primal, there is that primal thing of like, there's also like a long description at one point of a spider crawling down someone's face. And that came, like I was actually, I was on holiday when I wrote that. And like I had, I had gotten into bed and we had these like weird, like hot, like Airbnb, like mosaic printed sheets that we would never have in our own home. And I saw a spider, I saw a spider sitting on my pillow and then it moved and I could not find it. And it was so truly alarming. <laughs> the idea that I had seen this really big spider in my bed and then I had to get into bed, n not like wholly unable to find it. And I think that some of that stuff is really like, it's primal fear, it's, it's wired into mm -hmm. us. And so when, you, when it's discharged in a book, it affects you the same way that you, the same way that many people can't watch like Law and Order SVU if it's about somebody like committing a crime on a child. You know, it just like, it presses a certain kind of primal button. Um, one follow-up question, which I hope <clears throat> also doesn't um, trigger any spoilers, but do you like do flamingos have like a specific meaning to you? 
I have a flamingo on my arm, actually. Um, That's huge. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that flamingos, I, I mean, I said before that I find animals kind of uncanny and bizarre. The flamingo is like a truly bizarre animal. It is mm -hmm. such a strange color. Um, those, those really tall wading birds, they have that joint that bends backwards. And so something about the way that looks is really unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, well, legs aren't supposed to do that. If a human leg did that, legs, you'd be in yeah, the hospital. They're not, yeah, they're not supposed to do that. And so many years ago, I was in Bangladesh with David, my husband, and we were in the mangrove forest, which is um, these this one breed of stork. Um, what is, I, I was going to say commutes. What is it called when a bird uh, migrates? Migrate. A, a, breed of, <laughs> a breed of stork migrates through this part of the world. And it is so uninhabited there it is so it is so truly wild that the animals have like no response to you being there it's so weird so we were there on this beach and there were these huge storks everywhere and they just it, they, it was as though we were trees they were just walking around us as though they were trees they become so close to us and their legs bent in this weird uncanny way and it was so weirdly unsettling to me and i know that that is part of why i chose a flamingo for this um just because there's something about that that is really weird. I'm glad I asked that. Um, <laughs> in terms of the wider sort of experience of societal meltdown that the book gestures at, and also that I think that that kind of God passage you just read basically evokes, um, I wondered if you were drawing on any personal experience. I know you've lived in New York for a long time, um, and yeah. particularly the invocation yeah. of a blackout. I wondered if that was something that you had lived through and were kind of yeah. used, referencing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was that in 2003? I think it was in 2003, um, the big blackout on the East Coast. And I lived here then. And I remember very well, like walking home from Midtown Manhattan to Fort Greene, which is where I lived at the time, and getting home and not having any food like I ate the ice cream out of the freezer for dinner um I remember that very well and I remember how it felt sort of festive and charming which is so distinct from how 9-11 felt right which is like the closest analog to my experience of living in New York City where that was a moment of such like horrific horrific moment um although people who were here may remember this like I went for a walk in Fort Greene Park on September 11th um, after having like watched TV for five hours. I was like, I have to go for a walk. And I went for a walk and there were people playing tennis. And I was like, oh, this is, a, a, and I understand that impulse. It is like a natural human impulse. It's like, well, I can't do anything in this moment. So maybe I'll just go play tennis. And I think we saw this like really laid bare at the beginning of this year or in March of this year when, when New York City went into lockdown we all, like, the, the first impulse was to go shopping. And, and that makes sense. Like, we were meant to prepare. We were meant to stay inside. And it was like, if you, like, you know, hole up inside, you, you're going to need stuff. You're going to need, and we all told ourselves we needed different things. We needed dried beans. We needed sourdough starter. We needed w whatever it was we decided we needed. Um, I understand that impulse. I understand how, like, in the face of something that is very abstract and unknowable, we respond as, as we do, <laughs> which is by going shopping or going out to play tennis or, you know, I mean, I think that this has been a fraught time for a lot of people who are cohabiting, but like, I think people have sex. I think it's like, that's your animal response to a moment of stress. And that is exactly what we see happen in this book. And the truth is that you could have bought your heirloom beans and finished them in two weeks and then what you're supposed to go back to the grocery store you know what i mean it's like it's mm -hmm. you haven't solved a problem at all did um so obviously you'd written this before the pandemic well before the pandemic because the whole process yeah. of getting a book <laughs> published <Yeah. laughs> takes a really long yeah. time but did yeah. the experience of bringing it into the world while you're going through this um kind of how did you experience that? Because I think one thing people will say about one thing people will say about this book is that they actually sort of recognize moments in it or relate to them from something they've experienced yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean I, there was no way for me to predict that that would have been 
um, a more commonplace set of experiences, right? Like I was extrapolating into what I imagine, what, you know, I'm, it's not satiric, but like I was extrapolating into like showing how like, you know, insubstantial our response to like actual emergency is. Um, little did I know that we would all experience sort of shared emergency and respond in our own insubstantial ways. So it's a weird, it's weird how that sort of was literalized, but <clears throat> there has been, I think, a sense of this emergency in the culture for a really long time. And we just have a very, very feeble cultural memory. Like we felt this way, uh, certainly during 9-11. Right, we felt this way during Bush v. Gore. We felt this way during many parts of the Obama administration. Like, it's disconnected from political leadership. It's connected to our unstated and unwilling, our unstated acceptance of global climate change, which I think we all understand, but all sort of choose to look away from. And our understanding that the very systems that provide fortunate among us with great comfort deprive most people right we all know that we all know that this is true like if you ride the subway in new york city and you see a person who is experiencing homelessness on the subway it does not surprise you it does not surprise you at all mm -hmm. which is such a like astonishing moral failure that it's like you can't even get, get your head around it. So that sense of like the bargain that we've made to continue living our lives is, is much bigger than this particular moment. So Donald Trump and, or coronavirus are like useful lens to look at this book through. And it's like, that's just what we have. That is the time in which we live. But like things have felt this way for a lot of people for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess uh, one final question I want to ask before we go to the Q and A um, is, I mean, it feels like in the book there is a lot that's unanswered about exactly what this apocalyptic event is. But I you feel like climate change is there, some kind of geopolitical stuff is there. During yeah. the time you were yeah. writing it, um, how did your thinking about those issues develop? Mm. Well, my sense of it is that like the true, like the scary thing in this book is the unknown. And so I just like gesture at some fact, but like I never answer anything. And so I gestured like quite specifically at Kim Jong-il or I gesture very specifically at Iran or all of these other things that we hear, this language that we understand is meant to evoke a sense of fear. But like, in the end, it's like, it's also scary to me that Lego is never gonna biodegrade. Like that's scary. <laughs> that's a really unsettling mm. fact of life and that we throw away our toothpaste top every month or so. And that's just like never going anywhere. It's literally never, it's gonna outlast us which is crazy and this is just again like this unknown the sense of unknown is really terrifying and giving somebody a little information is actually much more unsettling to me than giving them a lot of information. this book does not say oh aliens have landed or iran has attacked syria or north korea bombed hawaii it doesn't say that because as scary as that would be at least you could hold on to that at least you could imagine that New York Times news alert. It's much more terrifying to me that we live as we do now, where it's like any of what I've just said is plausible. Mm -hmm. um, that's a wonderful way of putting it. Okay, I am going to ask the first of a couple questions from the audience. There's some great questions here. Um, the first uh, is from Fran Bigman. She says, when did you know when it was time to spiral out from the characters to the big apocalyptic picture? and how much of that picture to include? Um, I think it was, I think it's like a, there's like a page number. I think I knew, I mean, when they knock on the door, I felt like, it felt like it was the one they knocked on the door. And I felt like that's when the book really begins. And um, so the, the part that, yeah, it's, yeah, it's page 32. So I knew that I could only have like 30 pages of, this seduction 
of the vacation before I had to get down to business. And I'm sure at some point there were 50 and, it, and what I'm saying is like just my editor's words that have become my own thinking, right? Like that like it had to, it had to get out of there. It had to move into where the action is. Um, but it has to also be, it's like a complicated balance because it also has to be slow and wind you up to that moment. Um, and in terms of answering like when the apocalypse or whatever is happening sort of comes into clearer relief, um, I guess the book that I would cite as like instructive on how to do this is um, Kazuo Shigeru's Never Let Me Go, which is an extraordinary book, um, which is a book that unfolds very slowly and appears to be one kind of thing. It appears to be like a boarding school novel and um, very, very slowly reveals itself to be an altogether different kind of thing. And it's not about like a particular moment at which that reality sets in. It's about a slow slide into a new reality. And so I think that, I hope that for this book, it's not like a particular turn. It's just like a slow realization that like, <coughs> oh, this is not a book about vacation at all. This is a book about something else altogether. Uh, all right, next question. Um, can you talk about how Amanda and Clay's relationship changes over the course of the novel and how it's changed since they met? Oh, I don't know. I don't know who they are as people. I only know them like, as they exist in the, in the like, hot house of the book. But I think that there's a suggestion at the outset of the book that um, their marriage is like, not bad, but just like, but it's, they've been together for a while and that like, it's like lumpy in the way you're, you know, it's, it's got whatever complexities it has because they've been together for a while. And um, I, you know, I, I don't love it when, pe I, writing is an act of control. So I don't love it when people talk about their characters as doing something of their own volition, but I was pleased <laughs> when I felt that they loved each other more as things got more weird and more urgent. Um, like they have sex in the beginning of the book and then they have sex again at the end of the book because I think that they need one another and that's sort of sweet and lovely. And then there's a scene where they're all, they're sleeping in the bed with their children between them. And I think they seem like a kind of sweet and happy family um, in a way that feels nice to me. Like I wouldn't, you know, if the shit is really hitting the fan, it's sort of nice to think that you would be with people you care about, like, you know, I don't know. It's like a kind of human moment that I sort of feel fond of them in that moment. Uh, all right, next question. I'm not sure if the person who asked this question knows that this book has been optioned for a movie, but it, the question is, the book sounds like the perfect premise for a film. Um, <laughs> And I, many people have agreed with this. When you wrote the novel, did you think of it as a film too? Um, no, I didn't. Um, I have never had any interest from anyone who makes films in anything that I've had to do personally, right? So there's no expectation that anyone would pay attention to what I'm doing and think, oh, that would make a good movie. Um, as I described, I think there's like a set of aesthetic references that include cinema that is like part of the animating energy of the book. And so some of that cinematic stuff comes from that. Some of it simply comes from the fact that I'm working within genre convention and genre convention cinema is like, <laughs> is dictated by that. Like it's, it moves quickly and it answers questions quickly and like you, it, it works at a certain kind of pace. Um, <clears throat> but I'm thrilled that it'll be a film, I really <laughs> am very curious to see the resulting film, but uh, I think you it would be like a fool's errand to aim to write a book that would please a director because writing a book is, it's hard enough to write a book full stop, like let alone write a book like for somebody to make into a movie, it seems really hard to me. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that, you know, if we were living in a different age, someone could say this book has a lot in common with the play because it happens in one setting and you have the knock on yes. the door, you have six characters. Yes. Um, yes. In fact, another reference that came to mind when I was reading it was um, the play God of Chaos which is made into a movie. God of Carnage. God of Carnage. God of Carnage. God of Sorry, Carnage. right. Yes, and so it's these two, two Laura, you're couples. such a good reader. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think absolutely. this, this particular subgenre may just be very much my, <laughs> my deal. <laughs> I, like, I like anything that's like this. Please recommend it to me and I'll definitely consume it. <laughs> um, there is this, there, 
so the thinking about the play in particular is very useful because I think that is very much a part of what well, I, I already explained who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. And of course, when I think of that, like what I'm accessing mentally is um, the Mike Nichols film. But I, I did see this extraordinary production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf when I was a student in London with Diana Rigg, who just recently died as, um, oh God, what is her name? Martha, as Martha. Um, and in fact, the protagonist of this book is named George as a gesture to Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Like, that kind of theatricality is really interesting to me. And there's a kind of way in which the characters in this book speak that I hope approaches real, but also feels to me like stagey. Like there's a kind of theatricality to it. And you can, I, I can kind of see the lights getting darker as the book proceeds. And like, so that, I'm very pleased that you felt that especially with God of Carnage, that Yas Yasmina Reza play, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, one more, a uh, couple more questions, actually. Um, here we go. Can you say more about how the third person narrator is to the, oh, sorry, how close the third person narrator is to the characters and how or whether that changes? To me, they seemed further apart. For example, if Amanda were reeling off her shopping list, wouldn't she lie about what she's getting and say that she's getting organic hot dog buns instead of the expensive kind? <laughs> Uh, we know a lot about her from that list. Would she reveal that about herself? I guess this is one of those questions that sort of like, if you had written a different book, you know, what would it be like? Um, but it yeah, would be interesting if you could talk a little yeah. about how, how you kind of hover closer to some of the characters than others. Or do you feel I that do, you, do, I feel do, you had a favorite? I, I do. Well, I don't think I had a favorite, but I do think the book prioritizes Clay and Amanda because we meet them first. And part of <coughs> the reader's experience of, I want the reader to experience suspicion of these black people. So the book has to stick closer to Clay and Amanda, even though the book does acknowledge that they, that George and Ruth do own the house. The suggestion lingers that maybe it's a scam. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess when I'm talking about like where the third person actually sits, I'm just talking about pushing back against something that I didn't realize I was doing, which is that this is just the prevailing mode of the novel as it is practiced by almost every writer I know personally and almost every writer I am reading in my job as a critic. So I like, it's, it's like, that is the dominant mode of like, of, entering a psychology on the page in like the good books of this moment. And it is, it's just one of those things. It's just like, it's the convention of the moment. And this third person godly narrator feels very different to me. It feels very old fashioned. And I think part of the reason it feels so surprising in this book is because it is in fact very old fashioned to have an authoritative voice sitting at the top of the book saying, no, this is what this person is thinking and this is what that person is thinking. I found it very liberating. And in fact, I really want to write another book that way because it's easier. It's easier if God tells you the story. Um, okay, I'm going to go answer. with one last question because we nearly have time. Um, have you ever wished you could go back and change something after your novel has gone to press? This could apply to any of the novels oh, you've written. Wow. Has the pandemic revealed anything about humanity and our response to the crisis that would make you want to change something about the novel? <clears throat> I don't think it, I don't think with, with respect to the pandemic, no, because the intention of the work is not to address the particular moment, right? Like there are writers who are doing that, Ali Smith, did it, um, wanted to write a fiction that was really up to the moment. Um, I think Laurie Moore just published a story in The New Yorker that was uh, that really wanted to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to write it. I don't think of this as a book about Trump or something. I don't think of this as a book about this. It is a book about this moment, but like, you know, not like in its particulars, not the moment in its particulars. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of have I ever wanted to change something? Yes, of course. And I think that that is probably um, that probably has hobbled many a uh, novelist. At some point you have to stop yourself. You have to let it go. And usually what I say when I teach, I think this metaphor is right, but I don't know for sure. 
um, is that if you are beating dough, like there's a point at which you stop beating dough and it's cake. And there's a point at which you keep going and it's bread. Like you have to know when to get out. You have to know, like you want cake. I don't want bread. Like I want it to be light. I don't want to like overwork it. And so overworking, even if you think it's <laughs> satisfying your own desire for like changing this word or changing this detail, you might risk the whole thing. The whole thing might break apart, you know? Um, yeah, it's funny because I feel like in the 19th century, no novelists would make those changes and they would just do like several editions of their novels, which seems, yeah, seems think, like yeah. a practice that has rightly died. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> Taking some of the control out of the hands of the writer is probably a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's what I tend to think as, as an editor. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Ramon, this was such a pleasure. I feel like I learned so, so much lovely. about the book. Um, for anyone Thank who so is much. watching, the book came out this week, so um, it, it's available for you to read. I hope this conversation made you more no, interested Kim, in Kim it. Kim told me to ha hold up the book cover there. This is what it looks like, so yeah, you're obligated to buy it now. A very beautiful <laughs> book with an ominous swimming pool on the front cover. Um, it's called Leave the World Behind. You should grab a copy. Um, and stay tuned for more of these events. We will be back next month talking to Jonathan Leatham about his novel, The Arrest. All right, thanks again. Such a good book. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Laura.